Welcome to what should have been last week's um, podcast um, with uh, our, our guest James Doyle. Um, we are about to go live. Uh, quick introduction and safety as well. Uh, can you all make sure you've got light clothing on? Um, <laughs> I would suggest either Valetudo shorts or some sort of linen pants. Because once this guy comes on to this podcast, the temperature in everyone's room is going to increase by at least four degrees. Okay? So, you've had this safety warning. You should be ready with the Valetudo shorts on. We have got... James Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just waiting for James to join. He joined us. Oh, he's joined. So yes. let's add him in here. Let's get, yeah. him, so, get him on. Yeah, James is a BJJ purple belt, kickboxing black belt, pro MMA fighter, and he's a coach at SBG Bradford and Air Valley Martial Arts, and for the English MMA team. And the prettiest guy you will ever meet. I can't wait to get this guy. It feels like it's been such a long time. Hello, Danik. Are you ready? Hey! Look at that! He's got some Clark Kent thing going on right now. All the Damn time. It. Are you doing your okay? glasses come off, people are getting dashed. <laughs> or put on their ass. In the dark. No. James! Welcome. How you doing? You're so pretty. Well, <laughs> how do you keep so pretty? You're going to have to, I don't know where, just, uh, just say something for me. Hello. It's okay. It's okay. So we might need to just put this a little bit closer. So if you just move that up, just so we can hear you, James. Can you hear me any better? No, it's a bit tinny, which for such a pretty guy doesn't <laughs> really help. Um, so we'll, we'll give it a go and see how it goes. Okay. Um, well, we can hear him, so it's already better than last week. <laughs> <laughs> you stay connected for at least two minutes, which is wonderful. Okay. So... James Doyle, how are you? How, how are you? how are you dealing with this uh, lockdown? I'm dealing with it fine. Um, I'm injured. I'm rehabbing my knee. So you guys are kind of all on my timetable at the moment. <laughs> We're not. We're not. Oh, I, I can run and skip and, you know, like I've got a cricket field over there where there's no cricket, which is amazing. And I, I can have a gay all time over there if I really want. <laughs> Oh, he's just, he's saying, look how good looking he is. Look how cheeky he's, he's, he's Mr. Looking. James. He's really uh, Mr. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. I can really just tell. His cheek over pinching. <laughs> so how's, how is the knee doing? It's good. Um, so basically, um, I keep having these moments where it feels good. I get a little bit carried away and I do something stupid, like I work too hard on the leg and set myself back. And that's kind of been the story of it, really. Um, even the physio said the same thing. It's case of pulling back you know when you feel the pain and you know it's hard to gauge things when you're constantly used to uh jiu-jitsu kickboxing you're kind of always sore always beat up so you kind of work through that but it's recognizing the difference between you know the fact that i'm working on a, an injury um so yeah it's going good I'm, I'm just doing my rehab as much as possible we've managed to get a rowing machine which is a good indication that the leg you know the the range of motion's better um at one point, that wouldn't have been a, 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 a choice, really. But I managed to get some work in on the rower. So it's going good. Excellent. Oh, that's that's really good, man. I know we were a bit of a struggle just before. And, you know, obviously now we can't go anywhere. You were doing quite, um, quite a bit on the bike as well. So that, that's really good. So we're going to go. I know like this is a bit weird because we've known each other so long. But we've <laughs> um, done a really good sort of list of questions, which we're going to go through. And I think... This will this will help you know um, introduce you to the world. I'm setting you free, James Doyle. <laughs> I'm setting you free, my pretty little sweetie. Thank you. Do you want to answer ask the questions or? Yeah, well, yeah. So if we just start with <laughs> how <laughs> how and when did you get into martial arts, James? Okay, so like getting into martial arts, I got into martial arts um, at about seven or eight years old. Um, my mum wow. enrolled me in a karate class after I kind of. Uh, seen Bruce Lee, probably by accident at seven years old. I seen Enter the Dragon and uh, that was a game changer. I seen Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon and, and I wanted to do martial arts. Literally at the end of our street was a, a sports centre where um, they held karate classes. So I just kind of went there and uh, that was kind of the start of it. Bruce Lee movies and karate classes. 
Oh, I think that must be the story for quite a lot of young lads, I think, because my brother loved, I mean, he never followed it through, but karate was definitely the first thing he wanted to do, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so from karate then, how long did you do karate? What did you move on to? So I did karate for about four years and I got right up until like my brown belt. Um, and then I kind of just decided I didn't want to train anymore. I actually trained with uh, a young lad who came to our class and he'd done some Thai boxing and in the sparring back then, it may have changed now, but in karate, we couldn't kick below the waist. And this lad is just low kicking me, low kicking me. And we never worked on that or worked on the defense for it. And afterwards, I kind of said to the... Uh, I said to the instructor, look, I need to learn and, and learn to defend that. And he was like, well, we don't do that. Which was the kind of the start of my frustration with that art at that point. So when he said that, I was like, but it works. That kid, you know, I couldn't walk for a couple of days. And and kind of my interest started to wane. Then I could see a couple of flaws in, in what we were doing and kind of came away from martial arts for a couple of years. And then I, uh, I moved into kickboxing. Um, there was a, re uh, a friend at school who was doing kickboxing. And he told me about his coach, and that ended up being a guy called Martin Fallen, who I've kind of trained with uh, for a long time. Um, the the good fortune I had was Martin had done um, a lot of martial arts. He'd boxed as an amateur as a young lad. Um, Martin had sort of worked in judo, worked in the traditional principles of like Japanese jiu-jitsu, um, and as well as developing his own kickboxing syllabus, which I kind of stayed under him and then developed into uh, one of his black belts. So... That was the early stages of like mixed martial arts. I'm talking like maybe like 1999. Um, and we were kind of, without knowing, we were kind of working on, you know, mixed martial arts. We'd have a, a kickboxing class on a Tuesday night at Martins. Then we'd have a, a judo in the gi. Uh, for those who give me grief not wearing the gi, I started off in the gi with him. <laughs> it was judo and jiu-jitsu principles. So we'd work on that. And... Uh, yeah, that was kind of my introduction. Like I said, I was really fortunate throughout everything I've done with martial arts. I've had good coaches, you know, yourself included. But then um, kind of you start hearing about more of this mixed martial arts. And of course, at the time, it wasn't even referred to. You know, you'll remember, Spen. It wasn't referred to as mixed martial arts. It was Valley Tudo, NHB. And I started looking at, like, you know, trying to get hold of videotapes. And I got hold of UFC 6, uh, which was Oleg Taktarov against uh, Tank Abbott in the final. Not, not a great... Um, not a great showcase of modern mixed martial arts, but it was, you know, the early days. And I also got hold of the Pride 21, I think it was, videotape, which was Don Fry and Ken Shamrock was the main event. Um, but Carlos Newton fought Jose Pele uh, Johns on that. And, like, I kind of fell in love with uh, Carlos Newton style, you know, his jiu-jitsu and, and how good he was. And, yeah, so that was kind of the early, early days. Um, I then started looking at mixed martial arts or classes that worked on that. And I kind of found um, a group of guys in Middleton who classed themselves as shoot fighters. It was very leg lock orientated, no gi, um, very anti-gi actually at the time. And uh, kind of went over to meet those guys and they were uh, super cool. There was only like three or four guys in there. I asked if I could come back next week and train. And they were like, yeah, super cool, <laughs> come back. Going back next week, uh, got my absolute ass handed to me. Um, as I'm limping out, I'm like, am I okay to come back next week? And they were like, yeah, no problem, come back. And uh, just kind of stuck with those guys, stuck with a gentleman called Chris Collins, uh, stuck with Chris um, for like my first few fights. And, you know, Chris helped coach me alongside uh, Martin Fall into like my, you know, my title and stuff. And then I heard about a guy called Mark Spencer. <coughs> <laughs> and it all changed. <laughs> <laughs> it went downhill from there. <laughs> all the piss take, the, the piss taking just increased overnight. <laughs> Look, you got it easy. You walk in, you float those little eyelids, <laughs> and, you know, snapping, and like shit happens. This doesn't work for me. I have to earn it. So you have to earn it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so just you, you've answered a few of the questions, which is really good. And and, and I guess one of the things I'd, I'd say it's really nice to see kind of Martin and Chris, you yep. know, still. Uh, you know, still working and, and, and still, you know, um, offering um, martial arts in their areas as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's really good stuff. Um, so how did we meet? <laughs> well, you... Before you do what Stitch Smeggy do, it, that's where <laughs> can't you remember? Probably not, no. I get it in the end a lot. You've got a good head kick. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, but no, I, um, you know... Back then, I mean, I'm not the most tech-savvy guy now, um, and I really wasn't then. 
But I kind of looked on the old SF UK forum um, and I just exploring classes in my area. And, you know, your name popped up a few times. Uh, Chris had mentioned you a few times that you'd cross paths with each other and train together and whatnot. And he'd mentioned other, uh, other people. But uh, it was you uh, fighting at Sprawl and Brawl, Neil Hall show in yeah. Birds, uh, Jews Batley. Batley, 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 Batley. It's all, yeah. it's all the same that area anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, I thought, you know, it'd be a good chance to go along and see an MMA show in, in, in the local area because it's commonplace now for there to be gyms and shows. And, um, and back then, there really wasn't that. I mean, like I say, originally at Chris's, we'd pull the mats out and we'd, you know, we'd, we'd wrestle on like the five side football mats and, um, it just it, we we didn't have the facilities, nor did we have the shows. You know, there was one up in the far northeast, Total Combat, and there was kind of like Cage Rage and that down in the south, and they were the only ones I really knew of. Um, so for there to be a show in our area, and Neil, you know, to be a great coach, you knew it was going to be a good show, and kind of went along to that. Um, and I think you won with a triangle. I think you triangled the guy. Yeah, uh, John. Yeah. Yep. So you triangled the guy, and then afterwards I was like, oh, good to meet you, kind of thing, and. I'd just I'd been emailing you and you'd kind of invited me over. Um, so I said, look, I'll get over and 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 whatnot. And I think my uh, my first night was at PFIT. Came over to Friday night at PFIT. <laughs> and it was inspiring. It was literally just like, okay, you want to train with us? Um, and yeah, just yeah. beat up. You were the only guy who, back then. You were nice to me. Not so much now, of course, but back then <laughs> you were nice to me and like you beat me up the least amount than, than anyone else. Everyone else... Because you like a fine wine, James. With age, you just keep getting that little bit better and better. <laughs> I'm not. So it's resentment. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, 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 the Friday night P-Fit sessions were pretty, pretty, pretty awful, to be honest. I think, you know, we, um, we, we, we tell the guys kind of some of the stories, but I think when you were there and, and just some of the battles and some of the... The stuff like you look back now and it, it's not the right way of training it's really not <laughs> you know i mean i i just remember just so much horribleness and you can look back now at fond, with a bit of fondness can't you yeah oh definitely like, definitely yeah you know one of the things that you, you used to tell me about you know being sat in the car in the car park and oh yeah yeah I'd know, sit there. just just think... tell us that because that, that that i think happened for a lot of people yeah, so I, the, the back of P-Fit has a, still has a really big car park. And I was relatively unknown to the team. Um, kind of knew yourself because we corresponded a few times. And I'd pull up and I'd kind of sit in the car park and I'd kind of be sat there. I'd be like, okay, let's go in. Let's go in. And, and I'd be trying to talk myself into just walking into the, uh, walking up the stairs. And I'd say three, you know, three quarters, like, 75% of the time I'd actually come into class and there was some times where I just like, well, oh, I can't do this, you know, and, and I'd drive home and just bail without even training. No one had seen me, so I was all right. No one really knew what I was either, so I was okay. But yeah, that was kind of my early introduction and that, you know, guys were getting iron and I'd never really seen that. And um, yeah, I think I might've got iron Man even though I was a new guy and it was just like, yeah, throw him in as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, like, so I shared that picture this week, like you, myself, Waz, and Dave, and they were like the guys who I, you know, kind of started training with and still train with now. But yeah, yeah I remember the first time training with Dave. I hate him. <laughs> I love Dave. I love Dave. He's, he's a good friend. But the first time I met him, because he's got a funny sense of humor, is Dave, very dry sense of humor. Um, you don't know if he likes you or not. He uh, took me down, which he did with ease throughout our time training together. And he got me in crucifix position. In a little black harbinger pro gloves, and he's ground and pounding me. So I tapped him, and he says, "Why did you tap?" I was like, um, "Yeah, I can't get out of it. I'm in trouble." He's like, "Oh, we don't tap from strikes," and just carried on hitting me. Like, <laughs> Cheers, oh man. wow! Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of the early days. Yeah, D D Dave, D I love Dave to bits, and yeah. like, you know, me too. Spent a lot of time with Dave and training with Dave and just hanging with him. But I think he is Marmite. And you have to just keep forcing it down your throat <laughs> for you to eventually love it. There's no easy way because you can't really read him. You know, there's not much. He doesn't give much away, does he? Um, no. Like you know, I, I, you know, I, I've spent so much time with him. I just, I think he's brilliant. But I, I remember. I mean, the amount of times I yeah. had people come up to me after the class where, like, people were concerned that 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 Dave had hatred <laughs> towards him. <laughs> yeah, so, but, like, he, he does it in such a 
in in it's it's not psychopathic, but it's just bizarre, isn't it? It's yeah. you're getting beaten by like a super polite, well spoken, <laughs> you know, just just intelligent man, and it just doesn't make sense that he won't let you tap to strikes, <laughs> and he's just gonna make you stay there. But yeah, he uh, he yeah, I love Dave. He's a brilliant guy. <laughs> so. After you, know, you started training with us and and, um, uh, and you were training at Neo Shoot and stuff like that, you, you actually went over to America as well, didn't you? Yeah, I did, mate. Yeah, and that, that was because of you. <clears throat> so we, we chatted about, you know, you'd explain to me that guys would go over to train in the States, which kind of blew my mind. Um, there were a few gyms at the time that I was really interested in going and visiting, and I kind of mentioned to you Team Quest in Oregon was one of them. Um, and you said, you know, you'd been there, I think it was the year before. Uh, and you kind of explained who you trained with and, and, and your time out there. And you kind of connected me just via email because there was no social media. But you connected me via email with like the coaches and kind of got to go out there for a, just under three weeks, I think it was. And have an amazing time um, training with like, you know, Matt Linland. I say training with, I kind of avoided Matt Linland because he just scared the life out of me like a lot <laughs> of the guys did. But it was just after season one of the Ultimate Fighter had just aired in the UK. So. Uh, the guys who were on it, like Chris Lieb and Nate Quarry, uh, all those guys who were on it were in the gym and, and everyone was really nice and got to meet Robert Follis, who was a coach. I know you trained with, spent time with and had a large impact on you as well, you know, as far as when you were competing and, and as a coach. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, go, going over to Team Quest was uh, was interesting. It was, it, it was good because they, they had a, a, obviously quite a heavy wrestling base um, I think it, there was only sort of Chris, oh, what's his name, the kickboxing guy? Oh, Chris Wilson. Chris Wilson. I think he was like the main sort of striking guy there, weren't yeah. he? Uh, yeah. But ev everyone else, like obviously we'll leave and who, you know, and, and he's got kind of that striking style, but his, his grappling is actually really, really good in his wrestling drill, really, really good. So good, so good. So you, you were pretty much just wrestling all the time and that's one of the reasons I, I went over. Um, yeah to get a bit of time in working that because um, there was talk of uh, me and Paul Jenkins fighting for a British title on uh, Ultimate Force, so that's that's why I went, uh, Ultimate Combat, sorry, um, so that's why I went over there. You uh, you met Matt Horwich, didn't you? Yeah, I met Matt Horwich, he scared the life out of me. He, uh, he's like, totally the, one of the nicest guys I've ever met, but as class would be going on, because like, he's such a amazing jiu-jitsu practitioner and MMA fighter, you know, but he'd be really intense on the mat. Um, and he kind of caught me in an armbar when we were rolling. And like Chris Lieben was coaching the session. Um, and my arms hyperextend as a lot of my training partners know. My arms kind of bend the wrong way a little bit. Um, so I was able to get out of his armbar. And uh, Chris Lieben kind of, you know, started ridiculing him, saying, oh, British guy knows how to grapple. He got out of your armbar. And then Horace just bang, whacks on a mean armbar. And yeah, my arm was sore after that. But he was really nice, super cool, you know, very, very friendly. Um, he was just, as I was leaving, he was flying to Minnesota to fight Travis View, who prior to that fought in the USC quite a bit. Uh, but he was, he was, yeah, there was some real cool characters. Um, kind of didn't go out of my box, really. As you know, the, there was a road, like Stark Street, I think it was, and one side was the motel, and the other side was the gym. I literally went from one to the other because I made the mistake on maybe the second night of uh, going to the Italian place or the uh, sushi restaurant. And everyone's like, you can't go out on a night. I'm like why not? And they're like, yeah, gangs and, and this and that. So I, yeah, I'm just going to go to the supermarket on the daytime shop and, and gym, motel. And it ended up being good because, you know, my, my training time was really intense there. Yeah. The, uh, they should really give you a leaflet or something when you, when you turn up and just say, yeah. don't go to any of these spots. And it is literally like, you've got the motel, and it's a motel yeah. as well, it's not a hotel. <laughs> which, believe it or not, does make a significant difference. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then you've got a car lot, uh, sorry, um, a car sales place, and then the gym just behind it. Yeah. And that literally should be the two places that you visit in that area. If you yeah. go anywhere other than those two places, <laughs> you're in danger. Because I, I, I went and got some Mexican food. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, I, I told I told Paulus, I'm like, oh, what did you do last night? I'm like, oh, I'm a bit tired from training. So I went and grabbed some Mexican food and, you know, and, and, and brought it back to my room. I was like, well, where did you go? And I told him, he's like, no, no. That's a gang area. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I, at the time, I didn't really think about it, but, like, I walked in, all right, now then, I'll have three tacos. <laughs> From 
killed so I see. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they were just like, I have no idea what's going on here. I don't know what language he's speaking. <laughs> just give him his tacos and let him go. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was, it was a pretty, big, pretty uh, crazy place. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, when was that then? What what year was that? When so you I went two thousand and three. Yeah, I went to early two thousand and five. Yeah. Um, okay. Just be interesting to know if it's how it is now. If it's it's not there, is it? Yeah, yeah. So it's still there, but um, a lot of the so like Dan Henderson moved to Temecula. He's got his own uh, team quest there, and. It's, some of the guys, like one or two of the guys, are still actually there. Um, but yeah, a lot of like the fighters, like Randy moved out of Vegas, yeah. Dan moved out to Temecula. Matt Linland's still kind of based out there. Matt Linland is still kind of based out there. He he's one of the just this aura, one of the scariest yeah. men I've ever been around. Like Matt Horwich was scary. Yeah. Until he kind of beat the shit out of you, and then he was like, "Oh, you're okay, guys. Yeah, we're... like Mickey Mouse, isn't it? It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he he terrified me, but Matt Linland, like he. He just meeting him first time and checking his hand, we were just like, "This is not good. I'm gonna get the shit kicked out of me by this man." He, um, I took him down. Like, yeah. I, I just shot him when we when we sparred once, and uh, I managed to take him down, and he beat the piss out of me. <laughs> he beat the piss out of me for ten minutes. He yeah. made me do two rounds, and he just leathered me for ten minutes. Yeah, I, I, I've never, and he was saying with Matt Horwich, like. It was really weird, wasn't it? Anytime you did one really positive thing, which you could say, right, oh, I'm, I'm getting this as part of my game, yeah. you would get punished. Like, yeah. I remember cracking Matt, Matt, um, Matt Horwich with a, um, a right hand and thinking, oh, that worked all right, that was quite nice. I've not really hit anything with my right hand before. And, and he picked me up, he ran yeah. me to the other side of the room, he <laughs> threw me against the wall. Then threw me down. No, I, I kind of just hit the wall and slid down. <laughs> <laughs> he beat on Bellavit and he just beat the shit out of me. It was, it was awful. Really <laughs> awful. And, and yeah, just. It, and, and I think that that kind of rightly or wrongly formulated kind of the Friday night at, at Peace yeah. Fit because, yeah. you know, there were a lot of sessions like that. I remember the little boxing guy, I can't remember his name. Boxing coach at Team Quest. He ended up fighting on the uh, Pacquiao uh, undercard. Oh no! Oh, he might not be there. I can't remember. He he's passed. He passed away quite a few years ago. But like he, he was me and him for one boxing session at six a.m. in the morning, <laughs> and he just went, "All right, we'll, we'll just spar for an hour." And he's a pro boxer. And I, I, it was awful. <laughs> yeah. Awful. You know, but um, yeah. So that's why we don't really. Try. It sounds it sounds fun. Maybe some of the younger guys who are watching at the moment think, "Yeah, we want to do that." You don't, no. you don't. Your brain cells will melt out of your ears. Do you um, think that gives you a different kind of endurance quality, though, from like what you guys have had to endure? Not not necessarily the right way of doing it, but I mean, you know, is that why you guys are still involved in the sport because you've seen it evolve and you, you've been through a lot of stuff? I don't know. For myself personally, I, I, I enjoy the sport. Um, some of the some of the changes. I mean, it's still a relatively young sport, isn't it? You know, when you take it into into comparison with boxing and other other sports. But you know, some some of the changes have been massive. You know, they've been really positive, and some of them not so much. You know, there's aspects of it that I don't enjoy as much. Um, you know, but that, that that's the evolution of the sport. I think for me, I think uh, knowing what I know now, like what Mike's saying. It, it wasn't like the best. I did get my ass kicked. Like I remember coming back and my arms just, I couldn't flex them. I couldn't straighten them properly and nothing against those guys. It was just the intensity of every round was just, you getting your ass kicked. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it kind of, you know, it, it prepares you. It prepares you. It's like those hard spine rounds that we do at a very specific time um, within people's fight camps. It kind of prepares you for it, but yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I know I wouldn't go through it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I like to, I like to train. I like to go and visit there and do some classes, you know, and see how it's changed and stuff. But I'm sure, like with everyone else, the progression in the sport has been such that we've kind of moved away. Like it's not hard sparring all the time. I'm sure these gyms are the same, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I think it was a different time when everyone was still trying to work out what works and what's the best way to do do yeah. stuff. I think we've gone through a bit of an evolution and. Um, I think we've we've learned a lot of those painful lessons, um, so you know we we can train more intelligently. Yeah. Um, 
at, at the time, like it were just a case of just piecing everything together. I mean, we had like cry guys turn up, boxers turn up, judo guys turn up, and it, it was just everyone trying to work out how how to put it all together so that you could do mixed martial arts in a way. I mean, I don't remember anyone not being a specialist. You know, yeah. like, everyone was a specialist in something. So you came from a striking background. You know, I, I've done a little bit more kind of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu side. So everyone would just try to work stuff out. I think we've, we've now, we're have we've now at a point, and I think in 10 years' time, it'll be different again. Yeah. Um, I think everyone's sort of learned. So it must I, have been a lot more injuries back then. I, you know what? I think, personally, the reason why we could train like that is we were only training like that once a week. So we would only have this this awful session once a week. Right, okay. Um, the rest of the time, uh, for a long time, it was once a week, and we were quite young. So, like, you, yeah. you're, you're able to bounce back. Like, yeah. I I wouldn't be able to do the training that we did back then at 40. Yeah. I, I, it, just, it just would not work. Um, you do one a week, and then you'd spend the rest of the week trying to recover. Um, you know, it's, if, you, if you kind of look at you know, impact sports like rugby and American football and things like that, where you've got continuous kind of, you know, um, contact between, uh, you know, fast moving uh, people. They, they can only do that once a week, you know, and they only do it for a certain amount of uh, months as well. So throughout the season, um, you've got to look at sports like that, in my, in my opinion, where that's the evolution. That's what people are doing now, where you, you're phasing your training. So you've got, yeah, the hard sparring rounds, which what which James has sort of mentioned that we, we we still do that, we still have those, but it's a lot more controlled. It's it's a lot shorter intensity. You know, the SVG guys um, over in Manchester, like Matt, runs um, a, a fight session on a Thursday uh, for the pro team and, and the amateur team, and you know, it's that and you've done it. Yeah. Joe's done it as well, so Joe's been to it as well, and it, it's 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 only for a short period of time because. You're not really developing your skills. You're just trying to tighten up what what you need to do for your match. So, um, I wouldn't want to go back to that those days personally. I, I don't think it's the right thing, and I, I'm not sure if I'm not. I, I think it's a really good question yeah. around you know does it does it teach you resolve and grit and that kind of thing because I think it definitely did, and and to a point there are some lessons there, but I think there are better ways of learning that. So how did competing feel when you were competing, when you first started competing, James? What was that like compared to now? I, and what I, I put you into it. competing? Um, well, I'd started competing from a really young age. So there was like um, teams and singles divisions in karate competitions. And like, I think I was about eight when I first started competing. Um, and you'd be matched up. Back then, you were matched up according to like your height and your weight. And I've always been quite tall. So as a young kid, I was quite tall. Um, and there's like a yellow and orange belt. I was quite tall. So, it's, you know, I'd be fighting higher level belts and, and older and bigger kids quite frequently. But I'd, I'd always competed. I, I loved competing. You know, I, I joke sometimes, me and Andy Whiteland were talking about it not so long ago. Every so often I can. But for the majority of time, it's hard to relate to the person who'd walk into the cage or walk into the ring and, and be really at peace with what we're about to go down. Do you know what I mean? It's It's weird. It's, you know, you guys understand it completely. You've both been there. But it's it's an indescribable feeling because, you know, like 10 seconds before they call you out, I'm ready to go home. I, I, I don't want to be there. Um, and I think probably, you know, it, it's something I've always felt. I've always felt that kind of nervous uh, energy. Um, but I've, I've, I always love competing. Um, I think it's so important. I think it's super important, you know, like some of the young lads I'll say to them now, you know, if you only compete like once a year or if you only compete like at a jiu-jitsu comp twice a year, it becomes a bigger issue. The more often that you can stay in touch with that nervous energy and that, you know, that, that feeling of nerves and excitement, the better because it becomes more commonplace. It never really fades. It's always mm. there and I'm always crapping myself, you know, but the more often you can do it, the better it is. But I've always loved competing. I've always kind of seen it like as martial artist. I class myself as a martial artist, I guess, but I've always seen it as it's nothing personal. Like, I've never fought anyone, never competed in MMA with someone who I didn't respect. There was never any issue like that because I just I have no interest in that. But it was just a case of testing myself, and I had never had no. I've never had a problem with you know if I win, it's it's cool. You know, and I, I always felt that it was very fleeting when you won. You'd win and you'd be like. Yeah, okay, but if you lost, you'd carry it around a little more, and, and I always would do, but I always kind of seen it as a contest. It's just, am I better? Yes, no. 
and and it, you know, it hurts to lose. It sucks really bad. It's such a hard thing to take because there's two people in there. One person wins, one loses, and everyone's watching and everyone's got an opinion. Um, but you know, once you get past that, and you realise the only opinion that matters is like those who are in the gym with you, your teammates, family. That's cool. But yeah, I've, I've always loved competing. Always. So when you look back over your involvement in martial arts, have you got anything that kind of sticks out as a highlight for you in any in any form? So when you just look back over martial arts in general for you? Yeah, there's there's so many. I mean, um, I really enjoy coaching. Uh, I really do. You know, once you start coaching and those, those uh, people you work with start achieving their goals, that can be really, really uh, gratifying and satisfying. Like some of the things you've done, some of the things Joe's done. Conry Mark, I remember Conry Mark, like that that was a really amazing feeling. But weird, like he's my coach and that, and I'm calling him and like that that was you know, there's so many. For, for me personally, I, I you know, I don't know, like maybe getting my purple belt in jiu-jitsu because I'd spent so much time grappling. Um, you know, whether it was no gi, with the guys who I came up with in the gi. I spent so much time doing it and it was finally nice to, you know, I mean Getting my blue belt was big, but you know we hear of the the thing with blue belts. So every other person's a blue belt, and people quit blue belt. And purple belt seemed like a massive achievement, like a, a real a, re, a real milestone. Because I, I I would have been happy to be a blue belt forever, but it felt like a a, a really big step up. Uh, so so yeah, that you know I, I, five years ago this week I got I got my black belt in kickboxing from from Martin. That that was a massive milestone for me because. I wasn't training regularly with Martin when I when he promoted me to black belt. You know, we're very close and we keep in touch. And I'd spent a lot of my martial arts, come, you know, traditional side of my martial arts coming up under Martin. And I'd moved into mixed martial arts and I wasn't getting a regular training with him. And, you know, it was really nice to kind of, uh, you know, put that on, on my CV, for lack of a better term, that, you know, I'd achieved that. And, you know, belts, belts are a weird thing in martial arts, you know, um, it, you know, I, I, how many times I've heard someone say, you've been doing jiu-jitsu how long? You're only a purple belt. Oh, my son's eight years old and he's had his black belt for like a year and you just think, it's very different, do you know what I mean? You'd say, all right, let's have a fight then, buddy. Where's little Timmy? Come on, Timmy. Put your belt on. That's but, uh, yes, yeah, so like, uh, coming coming up under Martin, who, you know, done a lot of judo, like, he, he did it the right way and, like, you weren't guaranteed your belt. It wasn't like, pay your money, you get your belt. It was like, pay your money. If you suck, you don't get your belt. So, you know, getting my purple belt. Any, any, any belt I've got in jiu-jitsu has been fun. Um, yeah, just a lot of it's been coaching. A lot of my highlights are coaching. And, and by default, that's other people's, you know, what they've attained. Um, but, yeah, there's been some cool stuff. <laughs> All right. So, what else have we got on here? So, um, we've talked about highlights um, and achievements. Um, obviously, you know, you've, you've talked about coaching as well. And... Obviously, I think one of probably the biggest tests is coaching your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Matt can probably agree with that. I was ace. So, <laughs> how do you how do you balance being a husband and the co and a coach? How does that it's work? Easy. Don't say you get divorced. <laughs> Although I... that would be an exclusive. <laughs> it's easy. I just do as Jo tells me. She tells me what to do, and I do it. <laughs> I don't believe that. Yeah. No, I mean. It, it, it is very difficult. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, it's it's something that takes an adjustment. So I know me and Marcus spoke about this. It's you know we had to find a point where we were husband and wife, but on the mats and in the gym, we had to be coach and and, and fighter. Um, yeah. And and that was hard. You know, there'd be times where Jord maybe need to push through and do another round, and make her do another round, and she might have had a bad round afterwards. She'd come off the mat, and then we'd come home and we'd be cooking tea and. It'd be very quiet and, we'd be, you know, <laughs> it took some adjusting, but she did a great job of understanding the criticism and the critique was to the athlete and not the person. Um, yeah. And it's that thing, it's repetition. It was a repetition of going out there and, I mean, she were active, <laughs> she were really active. So that kind of <laughs> was like, yeah, you better get used to it quick. Um, <laughs> Jiu-jitsu competitions, like interclubs, you know, fighting for titles or fighting at the IMAS, I'm always nervous because there's that brief second where it pops into my head that she's my wife. And I'm like, right, okay. I remember her first fight was like, you know, Spen was keeping me calm in the corner and uh, she's in the cage and they're announcing the other girl and they're just about to fight. And there was this brief moment where I was like, what am I doing? Why have I done this? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's all my fault. And yours, and Spenner's, and Spenner's. But yeah, so it's tricky, I... tricky. Sorry, go on. What was that? No, it's just tricky. It's, um, there's a lot of emotion involved. Coaching is really hard. Um, you know, it's, I've, I've coached for a long time. I've coached with, with Mark for a long time. It really is hard, you know. You give a lot to yourself with the people that you work with and you put so much in, um, you know, because you, 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 you know when people lose, you can sometimes look at yourself and think, like, could I have done more? Should I have pushed this? Should I have pushed that? So it, it, it is hard and, you know, inevitably you, you grow to care about the people that you, you know you train and you coach with and you work alongside you, you care about them so you know i i um it, it's difficult at the best of times when it's your wife i feel it's heightened even more i guess so in terms of um you two coaching together because obviously you know it'd be interesting how many how many fights you've cornered together um but you know you see you in my opinion you have a very good dynamic you seem to you've got different traits and personality you know personality traits that seem to complement well and you know is that something that happened very quickly or have you got to learn how each other have worked works as a coach and in, a, in each other's you know when you're in the corner I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know I could read your face and I was thinking he's thinking the same as me it kind of for me it fell into place like it's funny um one of the athletes at the IMAS um, said to me, I like how you guys work in a corner. And it's the same thing. Like, unless it's you fighting Marie, Mark will <laughs> generally lead. You know, we'll walk in there. You've got 60 seconds in theory, but you don't always have that 60 seconds because you've got to get in there, get the, you know, the, the fighter's breath back down so they're actually focusing. And then you've got to get out there before the round starts. So it's not always 60 seconds, but generally, you know, Mark will come in, he'll give the original, in, uh, the initial instructions I'll have the water, the fighter gets the water, I'll give my opinion. And while I'm giving my opinion, Mark will ask the third corner what they think or, or vice versa. And it just kind of happened naturally, I think. I don't know about you, mate. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, if we just start off with approximate numbers of fights we've cornered together. <laughs> so I reckon we've done at least, at least 50 IMAF uh, yeah. fights yeah. together. So we, we've cornered at least 50 people at IMAF. Um, and then I I wouldn't even know where to start. I no. mean, we must we must be what close to fifty a year just through Foyn Kazan and SBG at least you know through inner clubs and all yeah. sorts of stuff, not including grappling competitions. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, like I can't even remember the first one we cornered together. If I'm absolutely honest, um, for me, like. Uh, what, what I tend to do is in, in the corner we usually have a quick chat don't we? so same sort of thing with Joe like if, if Joe's fighting then you take the lead or yeah. you know we, we did um, was it Lexi at IMAX yes. yeah. so you, you led you led more with kind of Lexi and there were a few other people as well where we cornered together and I can see that you've got a little bit of a better idea around kind of their game plan and things like that and we've done that for Kazan as well so you know, there's been a good a good few occasions which I can think of where you've spent a little more time than I have working with this particular athlete. You know, it's not for any other reason that, you know, they, they've kind of warmed to your style or we've said, right, you need to kind of work a little more with James because he's got, you know, the, the, the game that's going to fit your style a little bit better. Um, so usually I think for me, whether it's a subconscious thing or not, you know, as we kind of run into the cage, if I think the, the athlete's going to benefit more from your instruction because you're going to be able to relate a little bit more what's going on and, and their attributes, I usually, from what I can think of, I would just give you a nudge and like, right, you you, you lead, you, you go. Or yeah. we'll go in and say, right, James, you, you get in corner and you, uh, you give the initial instruction. And then what I might do is just reinforce what you say. Or if I, I think there's something else, I might go, right, oh, I'm this. But it usually complements. It's not the opposite. Like we've both... We both had to work corners where, you know, there's been me, you, and, and some random. So, like, the, there's a good couple that come to mind, which I can think of, where, you know, a fight has insisted that a certain person comes into the corner because they've held pads in the woods once or something <laughs> like that. Or, you know, they've, they've done, like, three wrestling sessions with, with a guy who, who who's uh, a master ninja or somewhere. Or they live near him. Or they live near him. And, and we've just gone, like... 
they, they've been the difficult ones. They're the ones that are really difficult where, you know, they they don't coach at the same club. They, they haven't gone through the process that we, because we've got a nice little process that, that we go through to develop fighters. And we've been really successful at, at you know, at every pretty, at pretty much every level. So um, that experience and, and, and time spending, you know, in the corner with one another, I think it makes it easy when that, that person who comes in who who's just what the f is this guy on about? You know that that they're the they're the more challenging ones. I know it didn't really answer the question. But... Well, I, like from my perspective, I I've heard because I've been sort of maybe sometimes a third person or whatever, um, and obviously I just keep quiet and film or whatever. But like I've I've heard you two cornering together, and then I've heard you with someone else who maybe you don't normally corner with or or something like that. And the difference is worlds apart mm. like even when it's just listening to you both at cage side you know you don't talk over each other you you immediately seem to get what the other person is talking about or you'll both you know you'll both be on the same track but just one of you says it you seem to be very in sync whereas when i've seen it with somebody else you know they they they'll be shouting something completely different they they'll be just conning in a very different way that just doesn't gel and i kind of think if i were that fighter that would be hard work for me you know, yeah. when it's you two, you know, you don't need to work. You just listen. You know, you just need to listen out. And it's, there's no kind of trying to then figure out what, what it is you're trying to tell me. Just an observation from my perspective. I'm just interested to see what you guys thought about it. I mean, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's always easier cornering with Mark. Um, there's been times like through the IMAS that I've cornered with different coaches. And it shows the quality of the coach. Because what that coach will say is maybe they've helped me with Joe. Uh, if, if Mark hasn't been able to come out. And they'll go, she's your fighter, you know her best, you lead, I'll just kind of help out if I observe all. And, and again, even though you're not coaching regularly with that person, they'll recognise that where they need to interject and if they don't. But like you said, then other times you've got someone screaming something. Maybe it's just a particular vernacular they use in their gym, like a, a term they have and they haven't gone through it with the fighter. And you'll see the fighter like looking out and say, what you on about, you know, like looking out of the cage and mm. yes, it's tricky. I mean, it's, you know, there is an art to coach in some, you know, like, like I think not, not necessarily the best fighters are the best coaches and the best coaches haven't necessarily been the best fighters, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a different discipline. You know, I yeah. think honoring, um, you know, sometimes it, it gets, I, I, I know, I don't, I hope it doesn't happen as much, but, especially in the, the beginning of kind of mixed martial arts and my experience, like cornering was a free ticket. You know, it was, a, it was it, people used it to get access to the, to the event. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I take, you know, cornering and coaching very seriously. And, you know, the people I tend to gel with, the people I've worked with quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So like at the IMAFs and, and IMAFs, you know, I really enjoy coaching with different coaches. Um, and what I, I tend to do the same, like if it's a coach who it's their fighter, yeah. I, I just show up, you know, like um, th there's a couple of coaches that I've, I've really enjoyed coaching with. Uh, Alex Simlin's one. Um, Alex was, um, it was really good just, just listening to how Alex coached his athlete uh, at the, uh, at the world. So uh, Alex Williams. So I, I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, Steve from oh, where's he from? Steve from um, Reps. Reps. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I really like cornering with Steve as well. So I, I think I must have done I don't know about eight bouts with Steve, and you know I really enjoy kind of listening to how he coaches. You know when when we were cornering uh, Connor uh, over at the Worlds in in America, um, his fighter Connor uh, Hitchin. Um, you know it. It was it was really cool being in that, that 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 environment and just learning from from Steve as well. I think the bit that I don't like is is, is and it's not I'm not going to name names or say people, but there are some people when you corner with them, it's just hard not to say something. It's hard not to take over a little bit, and I think I, I don't know where it comes from, but I I like to corner with someone who I have a little bit of a rapport with. And it's not to say that I don't have a rapport with people, but it's like, a, it's a weird coaching rapport, isn't it? You yeah. know, like, I'm not here just to hold a bucket, or I'm here to listen and learn, you know, and I, I don't know, it's really weird to explain, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. But yeah, 
cool. Okay. Let's I've move on as well before we start them. calling people out. <laughs> There's been instances but, you know, like you... the, 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 all the coaches that I'm, I'm talking about, they have had success. So they've had fighters um, who have been successful. So sometimes it's the fighter as well. So the fighter needs to be needs to have a coach who they can they can kind of work with who you know it makes sense for them and 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 that's the difficult bit with coaching as well where you know you need to be able to um find what works for that athlete yeah there we go it's true it's true different people respond differently that's something you know you've seen there's people who need shouting out there's people who need slapping before they work out uh, walk out there's people who need a hug um, but yeah, just touch on that point. You, you're learning those environments. You know, like you say, if, if, if the other coach is maybe working or maybe it's someone from their gym, you can learn. I, I, I learned standing in the corner with Lee Bound, who's a Brazilian yeah. Jiu-Jitsu black belt coach, Josh Mottram out um, at the first tournament we went to. You know, he's, he's, he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach for Paul Semtex Daily. Nicest guy you meet and super smart. You know, I learned a lot from Lee. Chris Reese, who again, another amazing guy, um, an amazing piss taker as well. Chris Reese is up there with <laughs> his piss taking levels. He has an ability to just wind Joe up and then he just stands there and watches us as I have to deal with it. But yeah, <laughs> learn a lot from Chris, just standing back and watching him. And yeah, you do, you know, it's, it's been able to check your ego and realizing like I can learn something from this. It's not necessarily about me. And in that environment, the IMAPs, it was important to me what the athlete wanted. If I wasn't needed to corner and I was, you know, someone would prefer me to be holding pads for him, I'm happy to do that. It's not one of these things where I want to be seen out there. You know, I'm happy in the back if the fighters want me in the back. So, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, that's a different experience altogether, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, in the past, I've had a little bit of flack around how people um, are selected to coach different athletes and, yeah. And I think one of the things that, that, that you've touched on there, which is really important, it has to be the athlete's choice. You know, that's how we've approached it for every single IMAF that we've been to. You know, we've gone and said, right, what do you want? Like, And we work really well where, you know, Oli uh, Sawa, you know, like he, he you know, he was a, a great kid to, to, to corner and stuff and really suited your style. And we, we just, you know, and Colin as well. You know, we're able to kind of you know do some really good stuff with with you know in, in all his corner and stuff, and it has to be the athlete, you know. But you know, and it has to be the athlete's choice. But the the coach has to have the athlete, you know, be able to communicate with the athlete as well. And Definitely. sometimes I think, and I've seen it in the past where athletes have have got a coach who they've either picked or they've worked with for a long time, and you can see that it's not the right coach, it's not the right person they should be working with. And, you know, we, we've had people kind of move around and, you know, join and leave and stuff like that. And, you know, it's something that, that you know, at sometimes I've, I've had to speak to some athletes and go, where you are in your career at the moment, maybe you need to be looking at something different because I'm not sure if this is working for whatever reason. Um, so as a coach, you, you can't be selfish. You know, you're not there to be the man. You're not there to, to do that. And I think that's where both kind of, we're, we're really good at kind of just going, okay, I'm, if you don't want it, it's fine. You know, it's, it's not a problem. We can step back quite easily. We're not looking to, to have a 15 yeah. minutes of fame with every fight because we held pads with them once. And, you know, that, that... I think that's the difference, isn't it? You're not, you're yeah. not there for the fame. It's the hardest thing is you've got that connection yeah. with the fighter. So oh, that's yeah. probably the hardest thing to then step away from. Absolutely, yeah. But I think IMAFs are very different, aren't they? Because you've got, you know, I think that's an interesting different dynamic, I would imagine, from a coaching perspective, because, you know, you know, you both um, coached at the IMAFs and it's a case of you're dealing with athletes you've not necessarily ever trained with. So, you know, um, James, you're, you're a coach for the women's team. So how has that felt doing that? Yeah, I mean... I think I think the key is, I mean, when we first went out there, Joanne and myself, it was the uh, Open in Prague. And um, we arrived, um, Lee Bound arrived with Josh. And they, that was the only coaching uh, team. Um, the team manager was kind of busy managing, doing other bits and bats. But obviously the fighters, some of them are arriving overweight. And it was kind of a baptism of fire, baptism by fire. You literally just got stuck in. It was like... This fight is five pounds over. This fight is seven pounds over. He's an 18-year-old lad. He's never done much weight cutting. He's got a weigh-in on consecutive days. Um, you know, everyone needs to work out. Remember me and Lee Bound holding pads and working people out. 
on the on the landing um, on the landing of a, of the hotel because the the gymnasium was just too small to fit even just team UK as it was then. Um, but I think the key is just to be open, um, receptive, and just kind of put yourself out there. Look, if you need me, I'm here. You know, if you want to have a move around, you know, because someone might work out with you and think that doesn't work for me. You know, I have some. I'm very specific when I would compete. I would want something very specific, and I would want to be left alone other than that very specific style and that person. Um, so, like, you know, someone might work out and then think, don't work for me, which is great. Again, it's not about you. It's about the athlete. So, you have to step back and say, no problem. But, like, um, you know, you just grab some mitts. And, like, do you need mitts? Do you need mitt work? Do you need anyone to hold pads? Do you want to move around, have a pull about? And, you know, someone would say, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then you'd build up a rapport just naturally because they'd realise that that style works for you. I mean, a young man who trains over at uh, Next Gen in Liverpool, uh, Ben Petchis Kelly, he was funny because he, Prior to the IMAS, he'd fought one of the lads from our gym and he beat him. And he'd come up to me and he was saying that, um, oh, I've, you know, I've just been training with Spenner and, you know, he was really nice. I beat one of his guys. I didn't know if he'd be weird. And I was like, yeah, that, that's my teammate. I'm, I'm one of Spenner's teammates and the guy you knocked out. And he's like, oh, oh. And he was like, no, it's cool. And by the end of the week, he was really, you know, he was just so thankful that we were able to just coach him. And, 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 and that's it. That's all you do. You go there, you coach. And if you needed, great. If you're not, you're not. And, just be receptive. That were it, really. So, how many IMAS have you done now? Um, <laughs> so, we did uh, Prague, Bahrain, Romania, Bahrain. Um, and then we did Italy and Bahrain. So, like six. So, we've done six. Wow. So, you're yeah. certainly an old hat there now, then. <laughs> I feel like I'm an old hat at everything at the moment, I'm telling you, honestly. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's an amazing experience. Um, you know, like you say, it's it's very much a condensed um, case of, of coaching. And sometimes you'll get athletes that return, um, you know, like uh, Melissa Mullins was someone who's done a couple of tournaments, Alexi and Megan, so you get to build a rapport up. And naturally, you kind of keep in touch when you, when you leave the tournament as well. So, you know, you keep an eye on those people and you look out for what they're doing. Um, but yeah, six tournaments now. Um, Joe keeps dragging me along. I'm like, I, I might sit this one out. It's like, no, you're coming with us. Um, of course, if, if any time, you know, you're part of the ladies uh, team, England team, any time you'd be fighting, I'd be there anyway. So, well, yeah, we'll just see. It is a lot of fun, though, I have to say. It's, 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 I think they're strange in a way because they're, they're very stressful. It's hard work. Obviously, it's very tiring for you guys. Um, but, you know, I think it's, such a good atmosphere when you're out there. Everyone has a blast. I think it's it's a really interesting com competition. I love it. Yeah. Rome, Rome was interesting because obviously, like, we got to Rome, I think, the day before you, Joanne and myself. Joanne was coaching, Marie yeah. was fighting. So we get to Rome and, and it's like on a campsite. So in these campers, like, kind of caravans. So they showed us where we were staying, Joanne and myself. And I literally could touch either wall just by extending my arms. <laughs> I was like, you got long sexy week. arms, that's no problem. <laughs> I'm like, we're not doing a week here. So I, I went and spoke to him and I says, look, you know, with the coaching staff and, um, you know, with there's four of us, is there any way four of us can get in uh, uh, a cabin together without consulting you guys, of course? We thought we'd surprise <laughs> um, But yeah, so we managed to get somewhere with like a kitchen area because obviously, you know, for food prep for Marie and whatnot. Um, yeah, and we ended up living together in a caravan for a week and no, no, no one died. It was good. I know. I, do you know what? I was so impressed that we all survived that. I had a blast. Very good. Very really good. I think. I think. What? What a lot of people, you know, like. I think. I don't, well, it's a lot of hard work. You know, it's a lot of long <laughs> hours. Um, you know, you do build a rapport with with, with the, the guys, and I think that's just in our nature to kind of try and help people and and do that, which which means you are working some some crazy hours like up at six and back at eight and you're grabbing a pizza or some whatever whatever you can grab on the way. Um I think I think uh yeah the 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 good, the fun, you get to meet some good people and have a, a nice time. Uh, sometimes you end up babysitting people at the entrance <laughs> of a, a campsite. Um uh, but luckily yeah. that guy is now uh, a <laughs> I, th I think I think we're family <laughs> but yeah yeah, it's, yeah, good, uh, good times. Yeah. yeah, I've got to say that about the sport. I think you create some very good memories out of it, and you meet some good people as well. I, I, yeah, I like the the IMAS for me. Like, you know, I, it, it it's such a it. 
I've never really experienced anything like it because it's a week long. Uh, you know, it, 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 you've got people from all over the world with different customs and different approaches to to everything. You've got um, a group of people from the UK. Some of them you you probably train with once if you're lucky, and you try to build a rapport and you try to help them and support them. You're cutting weight. You know, you're doing you know weird shit like you know try to find a little bit of food for them or you know sauntering in some odd place or it's you know, jogging past a llama every day. It, it just creates so many different experiences in such a short period of time that you come away. I don't think you really appreciate it until like a couple of weeks after when you've had time to, to yeah. sleep. Um, but yeah, and, but the people as well who work at the IMAFs, like, you know, you got uh, Ricky, uh, Ricky Wright, who, who, who's an absolute legend. Um, you know, I, I know your first experience of Ricky was... Uh, <laughs> It's quite an interesting one in Vegas. So uh, I love, I love yeah, Ricky. I love Ricky. What, what were your initial opinion of Ricky? <laughs> Call me a dick. I love Ricky Wright, and Ricky Wright knows this. I told him because first time I met him was in Vegas when we were over there for USC 200, and he was just, he was excitable, let's say. And then the next time I met him was in Romania when all the Welsh team were part of Team UK. And I'm sat like I am now talking to Chris and Ricky comes in front and sits in front of me with his back to me, which is a, you know, he didn't realise maybe I was part of it. So maybe like, what did you put to push up against him? <laughs> maybe, I'll have to ask Ricky. But anyway, I was like, this guy's a dick. Anyway, uh, we got chatting and I was like, no, dude, you know what? You're a good guy, but I hated you when I first met you. He was like, why? Because he's such a sweetheart. Ricky, I yeah. love Ricky. Um, uh, you know, I can be a grumpy bastard at times, I'm sure. But uh, Ricky was like, why, what did I do? And I told him, he was like, oh, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I, I would have hated me too. But um, he kind of broke the ice because after all that, he was he, he seen that we were talking to you on FaceTime and he ran over while Joe and I were having breaths. Like, Spanner, Spanner. So I was like, oh, he's okay then. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ricky. I love Ricky, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the elephant in the room, it's time... <laughs> It's time to discuss this. Okay. What do you think we need to discuss? Or what do we need to bring up and, and put out to the public? The fact that I had my hair cut, I know it's a bit of a... Uh, it's all over. You pull it off it's good. Cool. You pull it off good. <laughs> but Joe's asked what me. we're talking about. We're talking about the alter ego. The alter... Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Sorry, How you're breaking up. On earth. <laughs> We all know why this happened. Look at him. Just, everyone, you've got 30 seconds just to appreciate the man <laughs> me that is big, sexy. <laughs> the hottest guy. Oh, no. We've we're going to cut out. We're going to cut out. We had not talked about big, sexy. No. We're going to we're gonna have to do a part two, I think, are we? I think we need a part two. Part two. Part two. We're going to start off discussing. Why? You know why? Just look at him. You've got 1 minute 38 to appreciate the sexiness, <laughs> the big sexiness of James Doyle. <laughs> so we're not, we're not talking. We are talking. Okay. So we're going to have to do a part two. We've gone over an hour, so yeah, it it's, cuts us off, it's going to cut us off. So okay. part two, the big sexy story. Make sure you've got your tight Valetudo pants or some loose linen shirts on otherwise you're going to be too hot this guy will raise the temperature by at least four degrees you've been warned this is a warning we don't want any lawsuits for heat stroke because we bring him back look at that even he's too warm jeez anything to finish with before we, we... looking forward to the next chat james <laughs> no i'm looking forward to the fights next week i need some fights in my life so I'm looking forward to the fights, and I'm baking. I'm baking brownies. Oh, I made chocolate chip cookies this week, and they were amazing. I was yeah. well impressed with them. So, safety tip for you, James, okay? If you're going to be using a hot stove, <laughs> and you're going to be in the room as well, I want yeah. to see a fire extinguisher. Okay. Four degrees plus 200 degrees, which is what you normally bake brownies at. That's going to start a fire, kid. This has been... <laughs> Get on the pony with this guy right here, James Doll. We're going to get cut off. You've got five seconds. Suck it in. Lap it in, guys. <laughs>
Thank you, Jim.